Hey, everybody. Uh, give it a second here because I think we actually started. Oh, we actually started on time, Jack. Look at that. Um, somebody's going to say something about enabling the chat, and I'm going to say um, I would love to know how to do that, but I'm currently on my iPad, so the chat may or may not be enabled. I have no idea. <laughs> um, but if you have questions for us, please post them in the Q&A, and I suppose we would accept maybe some hazing in the Q&A unless the chat is enabled, in which case you can haze away. Oh, there you go, Joe. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so I am uh, Adam Boatsman, Managing Partner of BGW CPA, and I have my cohort here, Jack Santiello, uh, esteemed uh, Juris Doctorate with a Shoemaker. I just love saying that you're a doctorate um, there, Jack. Uh, no, I was we're, we're not allowed to say that in public. Actually, it's misleading and it's against the law for me to say, put doctor in front of my name, which I think is. Well, that, yeah, but, but I can say it. You can say it, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. Just Shoemaker's going to edit this out before they put it on the, put it on the uh, webinar. But uh, Gary is traveling to Wyo Wyo. Did I ever leave Ohio today? So it's just me and Jack, which means that, um, hey, we might end up early. We're going to be speedy and efficient. Um, but anyway, uh, for today's topic, We've had a few couple preceded questions, um, but most of this focus today is going to be um, still on um, labor, labor market, and how to incorporate that into um, not giving up the farm uh, from an economic standpoint while recognizing we we still have to attract labor. Uh, all of that said, Jack, you know the only thing that I had to open with, uh, you know, it's funny if I. You know, Kimmel's a lot better about his opening monologue than we are. So we probably ought to take a lesson from that. But because I'm, you know, rainbows and unicorns will be leaving after this next statement. I don't know, you know, how much to read into it. But uh, in previous webinars, my report back from client meetings has been people concerned about an economic slowdown and recession. But other than concern, no evidence yet other than you know we had one specialty footwear company that sold exclusively to big box retailers and they were done that was it it's the only data point that i had well yesterday i had a meeting with the specialty logistics company that you know has been in contact with all of you know all their customers which typically you know freight brokers and stuff like that and you know th these are like you know not fedex ups amazon style deliveries. I mean, it's complicated stuff, but they're down pretty significantly. And, you know, they, according to the owner of this company says, look, man, I'm always a leading indicator. You know, I called 08 before 08 happened, you know, so he's just like, I'm down. Like, I, I, th I think we're here, you know, I'm down and everybody across countries down. I don't know what that means. Uh, overall or what will happen. I'm just saying that I felt I felt compelled to report, you know, first data point out of the BGW client base where someone says, I'm down, I'm calling it, it's a leading indicator. Um, so, you know, it's up to you now, Jack, to bring the rainbows and unicorns. All right. Well, you know, it, I agree. It's, I, I joke around about, you know, what are you listening? Are you watching, um, you know, MSNBC, CNBC or watching Fox News kind of thing? Um, that concept of hearing the same story or hearing having kind of the same facts, but then the spin of it uh, applies to this topic as well. And so um, as I was looking through kind of, you know, trying to generate the statistics that I usually like to give uh, some of the objective data when we, when we start out these conversations, that it all kind of led to uh, the Fed and what they call the beige book. And so I thought, and, and I don't like just reading off of things, but it was kind of the most concise thing that I could find uh, on kind of the state of the economy, which then leads us into discussing wage issues and retention issues and, and, and all of that. So um, this, what I'm about to share is the kind of aggregation of what each of the Federal Reserve Bank uh, units, they call them contacts, uh, report back in, and then you can go and see kind of the individual breakout if you were to go to the Fed uh, website. So um, what they say is that, uh, that the information from most districts indicated economic growth was modest during July and August, 
consumer spending on tourism was stronger than expected, surging um, what most considered to be the last stage of pent up demand for leisure travel and from the pandemic era, but other retail spending continued to slow, especially on non-essential items. Um, there were reports suggesting consumers may have exhausted their savings and relying more on borrowing to support, to support spending. Uh, and there's a, a statistic in here that I think uh, it's gone over $1 billion in credit card debt collectively, um, which is a new milestone. You think, okay, well, um, I'm sorry, maybe it's $1 trillion. It has to be $1 trillion, right? So um, the uh, manufacturing uh, is noting that supply chain delays improved and that uh, um, manufacturers were better able to meet existing orders. New orders were stable or declined and backlogs shortened as demand for manufactured goods waned. Um, one sector where supply did not become more available was single family housing. And nearly all districts reported inventory of homes for sale remain constrained new construction activity picked up for single family housing, but it was noted that construction of affordable housing units was increasingly challenged by higher financing costs and rising insurance premiums. Bankers from different districts had mixed experiences with growth in loan demand. Um, most are saying that consumer loan balances rose and some are reporting higher delinquencies on consumer credit lines. Um, you know, that may be uh, skewed a little bit. I mean, if there's more borrowing, then there's likely going to be more delinquencies. Uh, agriculture was mixed. Um, the drought situations and others have influ influenced that and costs are rising because of that. And then they go specifically into uh, two core areas, the labor market specifically uh, and prices. And what they had to say about labor markets was job growth subdued across the nation. Hiring slowed, imbalances persisted in the labor market as availability of skilled workers and the number of applicants remained constrained. Worker retention improved, but only in certain sectors such as manufacturing and transportation. Um, many of the contacts of these districts uh, suggest that the second half of the year will be different when describing wage growth. Growth and labor cost pressures was elevated, uh, often exceeding expectations during the first half of the year but nearly all districts indicated businesses renewed their previously unfulfilled expectations that wage growth will slow broadly in the near term. And then another indicator is for prices. Most districts reported price growth slowed overall, decelerating faster in manufacturing and consumer goods sectors. However, most districts highlighted sharp increases in property insurance costs, uh, indicated input price growth slowed less than selling prices as businesses struggled to pass along cost pressures, which is going to be important when we talk about wages, increased wages, and how do you deal with that? And essentially, I think there, there are kind of two ways, essential ways to deal with it. Either it eats into your profits or you pass it along. You either keep it or you pass it along. And so um, that's important that um, they struggle, they're struggling to pass along these cost pressures to their consumers. Profit margins reportedly fell in several districts. So, and as I said, it goes into uh, parsing out the detail by each Federal Reserve District. So um, again, kind of an overall snapshot of where things are at according to the Fed. Um, and I, I've read a lot of articles that will support that, but then, okay, I just told you essentially a bunch of factual situations and interpretations by federal government officials, but you can easily go into and do a Google search and find different interpretations of the same data. So uh, it really, and, and with that, what happens, what I think is it comes down to what is going on in your own business, in your own industry, with your own workers. Um, you know, so it really becomes a localized issue for you in your market. Um, but you have all of the external factor and constraints with regard to supply chain and all those other things. So um, a lot of information going through, you know, kind of the, the thought process and analysis as to. How does all of this impact you, your workers, your wages, your prices, and your profitability?
Yeah, got it. Way to way to land the plane there, Jack. Way to land the plane. Um, so you know, the the one the one opening question that we had was actually related to um working capital. And I swear I'm gonna relate that back to wages. <laughs> That's part of my answer. But you know, it's it's effectively, you know. Hey, can you can you definitively say how much working capital does a company really need? Um, you know, not you know the it depends answer. So then I'll give the it depends answer. So first off, to answer the question, just a refresher for everybody's listening, what's working capital? You know that that really is a sexy definition for you know the cash in and cash out that a business needs to fulfill on its um, monthly kind of confined to a twelve month period typically obligations. So the mathematical formula for that is containing your balance sheet. You know, it's effectively current assets, less current liabilities, or, you know, cash plus inventory, plus accounts receivable, plus prepaids, less, you know, accounts payable, less um, accrued uh, expenses, less, um, you know, current portion of long-term debt. So, you know, it's just, it's just a ratio. And in terms of, um, you know, what is that ratio supposed to be? You know, generally speaking for most companies, you know, two times current assets over current liabilities is kind of your, your target that you're shooting for. Um, the quick ratio, which is a measure of uh, cash plus accounts receivable, less payables and current portion of long-term debt you know, that ratio they're looking for, you know, one-to-one, you know, because it excludes inventory because it takes time to sell inventory and sometimes inventory can be misleading. But the the problem is that, you know, people hear that and they're like, okay, cool. Well, if one's my target, then surely two would be better. <laughs> you know, or if two my tar- two's my target, then surely three would be better. And, you know, you end up with like this, you know, headbutt between, you know, not enough cash and too much cash. (laughs) So what I can say is that based on BGW's experience, the person that has the responsibility to pay the bills and fund the payroll always wants more cash than they really need. And they are in constant conflict with the person that would like to take the cash out, put it in the pocket and do something with it you know, or make an investment in something or do something different with it to potentially make more money either within the business or, or elsewhere. So when it comes to, you know, what's the right amount to keep in a company um, and how does that relate to a recession? Because you should be trying to um, strengthen your balance sheet relative to coming to a recession is that, you know, the, it depends answer is that it's really a spectrum based on risk tolerance. So, you know, probably, you know, the minimum amount of, um, cash, they literally just, just cash, you know, one payroll is a good number to shoot for, you know, it's kind of a minimum number to keep on hand for a cash reserve. Be great if it was more than that, but kind of a good minimum bar is, you know, one payroll when it comes to, okay, that's great. How to expand that out to working capital, you know, generally what we like to see is that for that quick ratio, which excludes inventory, you know, generally, Two months of overhead, you know, is kind of a good number, you know, to be aiming for. If you've got a pretty significant cost of goods sold, you know, two months of overhead plus one week of cost of goods sold, good number to shoot for. Um, the the it, three months if you want to be conservative, you know. But when you get when you get beyond that, the problem that you get into is that you know while it makes people feel pretty good from the sense of like, oh man, we're told we got so much liquidity, we're all good, you know, blah blah. Like, you know, I can make all sorts of arguments around, yeah, but, you know, the cash is earning nothing, you know, risk, blah, 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 blah. Look, the bottom line is when you got too much money sitting around, you get sloppy and lazy, period. So as you're heading into a recession, while um, some would say store the war chest for the recession, I don't have, I don't think that, I, Jack, I'd be curious to get your opinion, but I don't have a lot of clients from the 07, 08 cycle who said, you know, I made every decision that I should have made 
in 07 and 08. So what ended up happening is, although they had pretty significant cash reserves, that allowed them to delay making some very difficult decisions around what to do with people or buildings or other investments because, because they had cash. So what did they do? They just, they burned through it, you know, bravo. But a lot of them, frankly, ended up having to make the decisions anyway. They just ended up making them six months later than they really should have. So they burned through six months of cash that should, that, that should not have had to have been burned into because the outcome was otherwise inevitable. Um, so what I what I advise people to do is, you know, strip it down to a minimum essential number, which you know we gave you. It's it's you know pretty much if I can go kind of, you know, two months overhead plus one week's cost of goods sold. That's a good minimum number, and just see what happens, you know, and then reevaluate it the next quarter. If generally your finance team is you know, not happy, but at the same time, not, you know, running around with fire coming out of their heads, talking about how the sky is falling. You've got, you've got a good number, you know, it's sort of like, look, we both feel like we lost. It was probably a good deal. You know, if the finance team is, is a little bit butt puckery, <laughs> you know, but otherwise not resigning in mass and in the hospital with EKG monitors hooked up to their chest, you know, you, you have, you have a pretty good number if otherwise, you know, and, and if you build up the cash again, then just distribute it right back out, you know, again, or make, or make another investment. But that's that I think, you know, and if you don't want to do two months, do three months, you know, but, but, but at least, you know, set it, set a ceiling, you know, like that, like finance teams, and it's funny as a finance professional saying this finance teams always want to set a floor, but they never want to talk about the ceiling. So what I'm talking about is setting the ceiling and set the ceiling, you know, pretty, pretty low, you know, to where, you know, you're just, I, I guess, I guess it's kind of the equivalent of like, you know, if, if you're driving on the interstate, you know, I don't know how you were Jack, but you know, there, there's some people that are like, man, if I got a hundred miles left, I better get the gas now. <laughs> you know, there's, there are other people that, you know, 50 miles left, I better get the gas now. There are other people that are like, well, when it reads empty, I know there's still a reserve. So when it reads zero, that's when I'll start thinking about getting off the interstate to get some gas. Okay, I'm not advising the latter, but I'm also not advising the 100. <laughs> you know, probably the 50 is a good time to start thinking about it just to make sure you're covered because you don't necessarily know where the gas station is. But 100 is, you know, too much. Like you didn't, you needed, you didn't need to stop at that crappy gas station because you had a hundred miles left, you know, you can, you can wait an extra 50 miles to go to the Bucky's, you know, everybody's going to win when you go to the Bucky's. So that, that, that's what, that, that's what, that's what we generally think from a working capital standpoint and how that, you know, how that rely, how that relates back to, you know, wages is that, you know, you just, if, if you don't take that approach and you start to have a downturn, we just see people burning through their cash because it's available. You know, they, they, they believe that they're they're they believe that they're doing the right thing, you know, and and maybe they are, you know, but I don't know. I mean, a lot of times I find that they you know they really they really aren't, you know, when when you look at it for the big for the big picture. I mean, they'd be, be they'd be better off saying, hey, look, to preserve the ship, everybody's got to take a pay cut, or to preserve the ship, a couple people got to go, you know, versus like. Nope, I know the thing's got a bunch of leaks, but let's keep on, <laughs> you know, full steam ahead. Keep on selling or right into that iceberg. Oh, wait, now we should consider turning, <laughs> you know, after it's already after it's already too late. Um, so that, that's that's my two cents. Any thoughts before I move on into um, wages and profit? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm also OK with QT and sheets for your uh, uh, gas station. Um, sheets actually has a pretty good uh, cheeseburger that um, was really good and not good for you. So, you know, it's really good. The um, I agree. I think that the it's just human nature to be optimistic and to say, OK, you know, I don't think people go into these economic situations thinking, oh, well, you know, we're screwed for a year or two years. It is OK. Let's see how long it takes for 
maybe there'd be a course correction or, you know, even knowing that the administrative federal state regime moves at a turtle's pace. We still remain overly optimistic, just as human nature, I believe. Um, I think that, uh, I, and I agree that you shouldn't wait until you have to look at your components of working capital and what makes that up. Um, I would be okay with beta testing yourself first, which is that um, create, and I'm not saying cook the books or do a second set of books. You can do it on a spreadsheet um, and it could be just yours. You don't have to really share it, but to um, act as if the numbers were different, act as if the revenues, uh, you know, so your working capital number is different. So adjust your, your assets, adjust your liabilities. And mostly I'm saying adjust your liabilities and see what you can get away with moving forward as your working capital, and then see if that can become your new norm, but maybe not spend that extra money or invest it just yet. Like have a few periods that you're testing it out. So that way, maybe you can readjust kind of thing. And an example I was thinking of as you were talking is that um, partners in a partnership, uh, it, we get paid money, but you get paid in advance on what is a quarterly distribution and that has to be determined. And so, you know, the, you, I get to determine how wide open that spigot is and I can put it wide open and take it to the max or I can ratchet it down so that the distribution, the, the catch-up distribution at the end of each quarter is more. And so, you know, over the course of time, but what I think personally what that has done for me, I've never taken the max um, per month, but that is just a self-imposed discipline to see. I know it's there and I know I could take it and I can adjust it and adjust it back down, but it just becomes the norm and becomes your financial, being a financial steward for yourself and your own family. So for your company family, you may want to experiment and do this beta test and then see how much pain there is and see if you can adjust it and get people adjusted to the new norm. So that is just my Jack theory of the day that, you know, I agree. Yeah. Try to, try to, um, become a little more numb to the pain or make it that it's not painful but do it in increments and not wait until you end up in a panic situation. And you're like, okay, yeah, we got to fire more people than we really wanted to, or, you know, we're not being as efficient, but that, you know, quite candidly, that's something you should be doing all the time anyway. Um, when you're putting together your uh, pro forma, your budget for the following year, you know, and, and I know a lot of clients and uh, that don't really do do a whole lot with their budgeting and looking prospectively to basically say, eh, same as last year, add 10%, you know, or, or um, you know, most of them are not that reckless, but and it's just, it, it, we all get bogged down and it's like, all right, that's, we're just not going to attend to it. And then it goes on and then everything turns out okay in 2023. So you're like, eh, okay, we'll kind of roll the dice in 2024 and not really do that self-assessment and self-evaluation. So um, yeah, totally agree that that should be reviewed. Um, maybe take baby steps. Don't go spend that that money that you know, you're know you hiding on a spreadsheet. You know it's there, but just pretend like it's not and then you know, make adjustments. Yeah, that's right. So I, that, that's a good, that's a good suggestion, uh, Jack, and that, that you were right. I forgot to mention that advice. What I usually tell people is don't go crazy with the money and go buy yourself a lake house, you know, make sure you keep it on deck in case you need it again. Um, but, you know, onto the labor piece, I think, you know, the reality that our clients have been faced with, and I'm guessing your clients too, is that, you know, it's, it's still, it's still not super easy you know, to find labor, you know, it's, it still is pretty competitive and it's still, you know, you kind of, you kind of hold your nose, you know, with what you're having to offer people these days, you know, with some, in some respects. So you, you were correct in the opening um, montage, which is as a business owner, you really have, you know, 
I, I'd say there may be a third option. You cannot pay it and see how that works out for you. <laughs> um, but, you know, option A is um, I'm going to recoup it via selling more or raising prices, or alternatively, I'm going to uh, just eat it by having wages um, just eat into my wage increases, just eat in my bottom line if I held everything else constant. But in reality, you know, most, most businesses, you know, if you, if you don't have a cost of goods sold, typically wages are about 50% of your overall cost structure. You know, if you do have a, if you do have a cost of goods sold, you know, it's typically more like about 25%. So if you think about like what that, you know, what is $1 in wage increase actually represent, you know, in terms of sales, you know, it, it, it may not seem like a ton in terms of sales or price increases, but if you didn't do it, like that could be your entire bottom line. <laughs> you know, like it, it may, it sounds simple, but like, depending on the business, if I did a 10%, you know, wage increase, cause I had to, to keep the team intact, that could be 100% of my profit. <laughs> you know, if I didn't do, you know, anything else within the business. So you know, with with that in mind, I think what I was hoping to take as a theme for this one, Jack, is that the, you know, the, the modeling, like it's pretty simple to model exactly what you said. Well, how much, you know, how much more would I have to sell or, you know, how much would I have to raise prices and stuff like that? And, you know, what always what always ends up happening is, you know, then I get mad, you know, because oh, customers are never going to, you know, go for it. You know, oh, it's going to be hard, you know can't raise prices and feel bad, you know, employees don't deserve that. Like you go through the laundry list of emotional reactions. <laughs> so what I thought would be prudent in this conversation is just to remind everybody that especially as we, you know, especially now more than ever, you know, as you're trying to make a company stronger, preparing for maybe a downturn, it, it's the time to revisit why won't a customer accept the price increase? And why am I mad at the employee raise? And I would say, it, you know, the, the unfortunate answer is it's all my fault, <laughs> you know, because, and, and I mean that literally because a customer accepting a price increase a lot of times is driven by the fact that they do not view me as a differentiated item. They view me as a commodity. And that, that at the end of the day is my fault. You know, like I have not, I have not done what needs to be done to develop a partnership. I mean, if you're selling, I mean, even if you're selling like retail clothing, you know, like, yeah, it's like, it's different. It's differentiated, but commodity like it, but I always love it, you know, have a, have a client that's up by me that, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a boutique and, you know, she calls me on my wife's birthday and anniversary, <laughs> you know, Hey, can I wrap something up for you? <laughs> like, what am I going to say? No, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm the easiest sell on the planet. You know, I don't even ask how much she's going to charge me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, just, yeah, wrap me up something nice. I go pick it up. I'm like, Oh, that's what I spent, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a sell that would have never happened without putting, you know, a couple, a couple, a couple, a little bit of effort into um, just tracking, you know, birthdays and anniversaries. So it just, I think that you, I think it's an opportunity to say, hey, before I just kind of bend over and bend over and take it, you know, why, why am I not getting, why can I not get a price increase? And then secondly, on the employee side, I think very similarly, why am I mad? Well, I'm not mad because they're not doing their jobs and they don't, don't deserve it. Well, again, whose fault is that? You know, it's my fault. You know, me, meaning like I, I did not like if, if I went, if I went to Jack Santaniello and said, you know, Hey Jack, you're not meeting my expectations. I have a 50, 50 shot that Jack's going to say, the hell I'm not, or I don't know what your expectations are. <laughs> you know, I thought that I was based on the job description that I can print <laughs> in my last performance review. 
<laughs> you know? Well, no, no, no. I'm talking about the expectation that I didn't tell you, you know, the one that you should have known, <laughs> you know, better. So it's just, you know, I also think that it's an opportunity for people to really reevaluate, you know, what do they what do they really want their employees to do like what what does an a look like for jack satin yellow how do i write that down how do i train jack on that because my chance i mean chances are if jack was if jack was an a yeah you know what guess what i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna give jack 10 percent raise all day long with a smile on my face and say i didn't pay you enough and guess what if jack's if jack's earning an a chances are customers pretty happy and when i go and say hey look you know I got to keep Jack around, how to give him a raise. You know, you got to help me out. I'm not passing the whole thing on to you, but I'm passing part of it on to you. You know, can, can you help a brother out? <laughs> You're going to go, hell yeah, man. We love Jack. <laughs> you know, totally understand, dude. We get you. We're there with you versus like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so I just, I think, I think you can model all day long, but modeling is just moving, moving numbers around on a sheet of paper with what you have to do. I think the action plan really comes down to, you know, evaluating like what's the underlying cause of why, why you can't make something happen. Here's the psychological aspect of that as well, which is that when you have prices, wages, hourly rates that are lower than your competitors or lower than the average, there is an implicit um, interpretation that maybe there's something wrong. Maybe you are providing le a lesser good, a lesser service. Um, we have to deal with that psychology when we raise rates uh, and it's an annual thing, sometimes semi-annual thing. And, we're, you know, because we're in Charlotte, North Carolina, we can't charge New York City rates, but yet we do New York City attorney work. Um, and so you have those that say, look, we're doing the work. Our competitors are really New York firms. OK, but you have, you know, a a regional perspective and you have attorneys that are doing work in this region. So, no, you can't charge a thousand dollars an hour for that work. Um, so and, and a client that would pay a thousand dollars in an hour um, is not going to. Well, let me say it differently. Um, so you're not going to have that bias necessarily that you're getting lesser service. I think that when you, um, but when you're in a tighter market and really, really comparing apples to apples, then you have that problem and that perception. I think the trade-off is how much higher, you know, where are you going to set that price? Where are you going to pay those wages? And and I agree with Adam that, you know, if if you're providing a service or providing a good that is recognized by your end user as being valuable and not you're not replaceable, you're easily replaceable, then that's where you want to be. But sometimes the psychology is it's not necessarily about the core good or service. It is everything that surrounds it like customer service, like client service. Um, Adam mentioned some things like, okay, you know, sending out an email on a birthday, how in this day and age with technology, that information is easily obtained uh, and, and a lot are willing to give that to you because like, oh, well, you know, when I give people my birthday, I get something special on my birthday, like, you know, free whatever, free sandwich or, you know, whatever it may be. So we've been conditioned to be okay with that um, a lot of times it's like, okay, well, I'm, I'll give you my, the day in the month, but not the year kind of thing. So, um, it, it's those kind of things that you need to consider in when you're setting prices, when you're setting wages. Um, another problem on the wage side of things is, and I, I, I agree. Um, and, and the third option is do nothing, as you said, but you either keep it and own it. And it eats into your profitability or you pass it along to others or, and I guess a hybrid of that is, is do a little bit of both. Um, but that should also cause you to look at what you're providing. Um, I, is it efficient? 
Um, are your costs of goods sold? Have they, have you looked at that to see, okay, well, we're getting stuff from five suppliers. Maybe it's time to whittle that down. So it's more efficient. So less shipping costs, less, uh, logistics to have to deal with and those kind of things. So, um, I, I guess maybe a sub theme of this discussion is you got to constantly look inside the box, your box, your company box to see what adjustments can be made um, or not and just kind of, you know, put blinders on and say, well, you know, we'll just increase prices and um, surely people will need what we're selling. So we'll lose some, but we'll gain some um, <laughs> kind of like uh, what's that actor's name, Herman Munster in uh, my cousin Vinny that at the end, he's like, win some, lose some in his deep voice. So, you know, yes. you take that attitude then, then, but most, I know most of you do not. So anyway, there we go. Yeah. So I'll pause there and see if we have any questions before we keep on with our tirade. All right. Hearing, hearing none. Um, you know, I think related to recouping it, um, you know, we've hit on this in earlier webinars as well, but I think as you, as you model this out, relooking at is a customer really profitable or not, you know, is it, is another element to look at, you know, in the, in the sense of like, a lot, I think a lot, a lot of our clients fool themselves from the standpoint of, well, you know, we make 20% off that customer, you know, when they look at it from a gross profit perspective, but then when, if you were to lay layer on an overhead rate associated with it, you're actually moving backwards on it. So that, that's, you know, so in that scenario, you actually, you know, by losing the customer, <laughs> there's actually a chance that you'd make more money because you could strip out some of the cost structure associated with servicing them. So that's, that's another way, you know, to, to, in other words, if you're doing your AB testing, as, as Jack was talking about, you know, another thing that you can model would be what would be the effect if I lost my bottom 20% of my customers? And that, that that gives you kind of the ammo that you need to say, well, you're kind of the bottom 20%, so I'm going to raise the price. And if I don't get it, <laughs> you know, I've already modeled, I've already modeled out what that looks like. So I, I don't fear, you know, what the outcome is actually going to be. But on, you know, back back to the employee side, I think again in this scenario, instead of instead of getting upset. Or accepting, hey, yeah, just the way it is. You know, we've got you know wage growth that's going to be never ending. I I do think it's a valuable exercise to look through. Under what performance conditions would I actually be happy paying that? And then figure out how to get those performance conditions because I it's been my experience. And I don't think any clients have had this experience either. Is that you know. As soon as I say this, you know, someone's go, oh, you know, you're wrong. I've seen this all the time. It's like, so I won't say never, but I will say it's somewhat rare that people are truly, you know, lazy. Like this, their DNA is lazy. <laughs> you know, in most cases, what appears to be laziness is actually a mask for I don't care because you don't care about me. Therefore, I don't care about you. So they're just, you know, hey, this relationship is transactional. You know, Jack, I write your operating agreement. You pay me a salary. We're even. <laughs> you know, whereas if Jack actually expressed that he, you know, cared about me or gave two cents about me, there's a chance I might, you know, find that poison loophole provision that exists in all the shoemaker op not that, that would happen you know I'm, <laughs> I'm joking with that right but i would go i would go above i might i might by chance go above and beyond so i just i think i would encourage everybody just to think through you know because you're gonna you're gonna have to do something you know likely uh this year so it's an opportunity to say under what under what what performance conditions would i be happy paying jack 
more money? Like, what is Jack? What is Jack? And and because the reality is, you're gonna have to pay in advance. You know, like that. In other words, Jack's probably not gonna accept. You know, hey Jack, you know your your raise next year is gonna be ten percent, but I'm only paying it if you do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> you know the the way that I think the reality of how these things work, if you didn't already have it in place, is hey Jack, you know ten percent, you know blah blah. By the way, we rolled out a new blah 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 <laughs> you know so going forward this is what you're going to be measured against absolutely and by the way as um luke skywalker said in star wars i care to leah <laughs> princess leah um nice yeah yeah bringing out all the old references okay so um another interesting perspective is you know we hear in the news about all these strikes going on and I found an article that kind of takes it and reverse engineers it, which is, okay, the strikes are going on, but why are they going on now? And so I want to share some interesting information from uh, a news article that came out. And um, it basically says, hey, look, over recent months, workers across industries from Hollywood actors to neighborhood baristas and delivery truck drivers have gone on strike putting issues like fair profit distribution and need for higher wages than national spotlight. There are no signs yet of the strife relenting. Um, why are so many workers going on strike or threatening to do it now? And um, it's basically, let's share the, what we think those answers are. And um, the, the answers that they gave were many workers feel frustrated by seeing their wages suppressed in less competitive labor markets and by the loss of a voice. Uh, they're speaking about unions, but they're also speaking just generally in the industry, employees versus employers, generally speaking, and a low unemployment rate makes it the right timing. Strikes tend to be more frequent and longer when workers have opportunities for possibly other work, including temporary work, as indicated by a low unemployment rate. And then they talk about different types of strikes, um, and then they go into some other factors, and they said... Strikes tend to be more frequent and longer when workers have opportunities. Uh, unemployment rate is low. Firms are seeking employees. Uh, and that's a good time for workers to put pressure on their, their employers to raise pay. And then they also talk about technology and that um, skill that the workforce has become skill biased. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but what they're saying biased towards those who can oversee computer and other technological advances. Uh, those workers who can oversee these modern technology advances, correct it when it goes wrong and operate it when all goes well have been in demand relative to those workers who do more routine work. Um, I recall having a discussion with my son many years ago and my daughter, but, but, but my son, my daughter knew she wanted to go to vet school and that's where she, what she's doing. My son, not so sure, but has an engineering per propensity uh, and will probably go into some sort of engineering, possibly motorsports engineering, uh, woohoo, NASCAR. And, um, but I said, the future is, and not that I had a crystal ball, but I said, if you are involved in something technologically based that you know how to use it well and, and or fix it well when it breaks, you can have any job you want when you are a young adult, essentially. And this is basically reiterating that. Um, and so, you know, those kind of, and so this basically reverse engineers as to, okay, yeah, we have a strike, but prior strikes have been, um, the factors have been this. So basically looking at it from the back moving forward, which I thought was very interesting and is in line with what we've been talking about for the past 45 minutes or so. Yeah, I got you. Way to go us. Um, yeah, so I thought the future was plastics. Come on, Jack. I got yeah, that. Yes. that was a good doubt. Yeah, <laughs> yes. going, going deeper than Star Wars. On that wow. Body. <laughs> that mental Rolodex. I was like, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. That's right. All right, man. Well, does anybody have any questions before we wrap this baby up and land the plane? Going once, going twice. All right, sold. So to put it to put a bow on this, you know, 
maybe recession coming, coming. Still going to have to, you know, consider that the labor market's pretty tidy. In other words, like sort of like the landlords aren't getting the memo that people don't want office space anymore. They're, they, therefore, they haven't uh, reduced rent. I don't think that if I stand up right now, walk out into the cubicles and say, hey, by the way, we think a recession's coming. So all y'all be thankful for your freaking job. No raises for you. <laughs> yeah, probably not going to go over well at, in BGW world. So, you know, accepting what it is, you know, I got the choice, you know, get off the top line or taking the shorts on the bottom line. Knowing that neither one of those, like knowing that probably the top line is the route that I need to go then you know the, the model it out and you know we feel like the correct answer would be you know what do i need to change in my organization to get the behavior that i want that i'd feel good about paying that raise and what is it that i need to do from a service differentiation standpoint even if i sell products to be able to get the to be able to get the price increase you know that i, that I need to get so in other words just you know use this as an excuse to finally do the work that you probably should have been doing all the time I will say ditto to all of that. And then also um, the offer is always out there as if there's something that is on your mind. I mean, we obviously, uh, the three of us kind of brainstorm as to in, and think about what is on our clients' minds or what might be going on in society, economics, the world in general, and kind of try to marry that together. But, you know, if there's something that is on your mind that you want us to, to chat about, um, possibly even find a uh, subject matter expert on so that you don't have to hear us rant and rave all the time, you know, let us know. Uh, because if if it's on your mind, it's likely on a lot of other people's mind as well. Um, unless you're really a, a kind of a off the wall thinker. But even then, you never know. It might be something that's relevant. So, um, but please do feel free. The door is always open to, to say, hey, do you mind chatting about this? Or, you know, whatever it may be. All right. Well, awesome, Jack. As always, a pleasure. And everybody that was listening, enjoy uh, your Friday and have a great weekend. Hopefully it'll be nice. Thanks. See you. All right. See you guys.